All right. Any questions about this political leaders from last class? We're good. Everybody got those notes up? All right. So we're going to look at some key Confederate leaders and key Union military leaders today. Then we'll do. We'll also do a little history on West Point. So let's start with Robert E. Lee, career military officer, second in his class from West Point. Graduated in the class of 1829. Uh, people are always wondering, well, who was the first in this class? Uh, and what did that guy do? That guy is Charles Mason, who was um, a lawyer and justice um, after he served for a couple of years in the, in the Army. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant um, in the Army Corps of Engineers, serves as an assistant to the Chief Engineer's Office in Washington. He was one of the top engineers in the U.S. Army upon graduation from West Point. In fact, he graduated West Point um, without a single demerit. Uh, no infraction um, on his record. This is sort of this is a pretty rare accomplishment. I most certainly did not graduate from VMI without a demerit. I promise you that. Um, first lieutenant of the engineers, where he supervised the engineering works of the St. Louis Harbor. He also was responsible for the engineering works on the Upper Mississippi and Upper Missouri. Took charge as captain of the building of the fortifications of New York Harbor. During the Mexican War, he was one of Winfield Scott's chief aides, aide de camp. We talked about what the aide de camp position is, right? We have it. An aide de camp is a general's sort of right hand man. Um, so Lee was one of Winfield Scott's right hand men during the Mexican War. And we remember old Fuss and Feathers planned what famous assault. You all remember the famous assault Winfield Scott planned? Uh, well, you're not wrong. The Anaconda plan comes later. I'm looking for the assault in the Mexican War, the decisive battle of the Mexican War. You family members of Devil Dogs from the halls of Montezuma. That's the Marine Corps hymn. It's the amphibious assault on Mexico City. The amphibious assault on Mexico City. I believe we talked a little bit about that earlier in the semester. Um, he's instrumental in several American victories through his own personal reconnaissance. Found routes of attack that the Mexicans had not defended. Promoted to major after the Battle of Cerro Gordo and fought in battles of Contreras, Churubusco, Chapultepec, and was promoted to lieutenant colonel by the end of the war. And that right there is an image of Lee in the Mexican War. Served three years as superintendent at West Point made improvements on the grounds and academic curriculum, became a lieutenant colonel of the 2nd U.S. Cavalry, was sent to Texas, the Texas frontier to protect settlers from warring tribes. Do you guys remember what tribes were the U.S. Army was sent out to fight against during this era? <coughs> the Comanche and the Apache. Very good. Good job. Well done. Uh, under the command of Colonel Albert Sidney Johnson at the time. We'll talk a little bit about Albert Sidney Johnson here shortly. In 1859, he leads the arrest of John Brown at Harper's Ferry with a Marine detachment and a young Jed Stewart who graduated West Point in 1854. Both of them happened to be in Washington at the time. When Texas seceded, he was ordered back to Washington. He turned down Lincoln's offer for command of the U.S. Army. Remember, it was offered by Winfield Scott. He believed that slavery was a necessary evil. He had few of his own, but lots of his wife's family 
freed some as terms uh, of his in, in as terms in his father-in-law's will. He opposed secession, but not would not turn his sword against his native state, Virginia. During the war, started as a Virginia commander of the Virginia militia in Western Virginia, became a key military advisor to Davis. He becomes commander of the Army of Northern Virginia after Albert, or sorry, Joseph E. Johnston was wounded at Seven Pines. String of important victories from 1862 through 1864. Some of those that are worth mentioning would be uh, victory at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Well, before that, he keeps McClellan out of Richmond in the Peninsula Campaign, victory at the Second Battle of Bull Run, um, victory at Chancellorsville, and then we're going to talk about the Overland Campaign later in 1864 between he and Grant. Gettysburg, hands down, was his worst defeat, a literal, literal turning point of the war that we'll be learning about in detail. General-in-chief of the whole Confederate Army, but this occurs in 1865. It was a bit too late for the South. Considered the most brilliant officer of the war on the side of the Confederacy. <coughs> He will surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. And then after the war, what does Lee do? Any ideas? You don't know? Well, my students from last year should know this. What does Lee go on to do? Yes, thank you. President of Washington College. So they'll rename it Washington and Lee University after him. Um, he is buried in the um, in the chapel, Lee Chapel, um, at Washington and Lee. Easy way to remember that. Their mascot of the generals. Get it? Um, outside the chapel is War Horse, one of his war horses. His most famous war horse is buried there. Does anybody remember Lee's famous war horse's name? Traveler. Traveler is buried outside of Lee Chapel. Any questions about Lee before we move on to Jonathan J. Thomas Jonathan Jack Jackson, a.k.a. Stonewall? All right. Let's talk a little bit about Stonewall Jackson. Um, born in what is now Clarksburg, West Virginia. Uh, family ran a sawmill. Uh, they were a poor family scraping by in Western Virginia. Widowed mother, his father passed away. He was self-taught. He secretly helped teach free African Americans and slaves to read. Appointed to West Point in 1842, struggled more than his other, than his other classmates, had a dogged determination to get through, managed to graduate in the middle of his class, um, 17th in his class, in the class of 1846. Pretty famous West Point class. You're going to notice that quite a few of the generals on either side graduated in that class. Served in the Mexican War in the Siege of Veracruz, Battle of Contreras, Battle of Chapultepec, and the Siege of Mexico City. Earned two field promotions in the war. This is where he first met Robert E. Lee. After the Mexican War, he accepted a position to teach at Virginia Military Institute. He's a professor of natural an experimental philosophy and was an instructor of artillery. Um, Jackson's maxims and teachings are still used at VMI today. Um, one the summer going into my rat year actually lived uh, in his classroom um, in that summer, which is still an old barracks. His cannons are still there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, his war horse is stuffed in the VMI Museum, Little Sorrel. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Not really liked by cadets, loved by local slaves. He started a Sunday school for both white and black children. He was called Old Blue Light and Tom Fool by cadets, VMI. Gave, given the name by Bernard B., 
given the name Stonewall by, the, by General Bernard Bean during the first Battle of Bull Run, holding the defensive line on Henry House Hill in the early afternoon in the battle. He leads what is, becomes known as the Stonewall Brigade. It's Virginia's first brigade. It's made up of the 2nd, 4th, 5th, 27th and 33rd Virginia Infantries. Um, they also have their artillery unit, which they dragged his cannon into battle. Uh, most of these regiments came out of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, he consistently defeated armies larger than his own. Um, this is one, one of the most notable is the 1862 Shenandoah Valley campaign that we're going to learn about in detail um, in the not so distant future. The Stone, Stonewall Brigade, Brigade became known as the Foot Cavalry. These men traveled up to 33 miles a day on foot. After the Peninsula Campaign, you're going to see that. I want you all to take note of that. Um, Peninsula or Peninsula Campaign. This is the campaign in which it was launched in March of 1862 by George B. McClellan to take Richmond through the James, York, and Chickahominy Rivers. Uh, Jackson's uh, Stonewall Brigade will come to aid Lee. This is where he'll become a Corps commander. And if you remember by the structure of the, of the armies, a Corps commander means they are, you have their army, and then you have the army corps, or the corps split up into how many parts of an army. Anybody remember? Can you give me a typical number. Throw, throw a random number out there. Five. Five's a really good guess. Five to ten may have been the situation in the Union, but in the Confederacy, they typically kept them low. Two to three corps in an army on the Confederate side. So for Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, the first two corps commanders of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia were Stonewall Jackson and James Longstreet. Significant battles that Jackson is involved in, uh, Second Battle of Bull Run, Confederate Victory, the Maryland Campaign, and the Battle of Antietam, the Battle of Fredericksburg, and then the Battle of Chancellorsville where Jackson's Stonewall Brigade leads this daring 17 mile march to smash into all Row Howard uh, by surprise. Only that night, um, following the battle, uh, Jackson and his staff go behind enemy lines to try to figure out Union movements. And when they return, he is shot by uh, Confederates guarding a picket line. And he's basically wounded through friendly fire. He's shot through the left arm. They have to amputate the arm. He will be rushed to Genia Station. Um, how many people have gone up Interstate 95 and you've seen a sign that says Stonewall Jackson Shrine. Okay, have you, have you ever stopped off? That shrine, it's actually not really a shrine, it's the house he died in. Okay, so you can actually track, track the ambulance route from outside the house back to where he was shot. If you want to get real gnarly on, uh, on a uh, um, field trip, you can actually go out into the wilderness of Chancellorsville and find where his left arm is buried. Um, yes, it's out there. There's a tombstone dedicated to his left arm. So Jackson, um, well, because his arm was amputated by his field doctor, um, who you guys are all familiar with. Have you ever noticed the McGuire Veterans Hospital and the McGuire Medical Center? Anybody ever notice that? McGuire was his field doctor. McGuire is also the guy that basically founded 
the, the Medical College of Virginia. Okay. Uh, his, I'm getting ahead of myself, but his arm's amputated. He's rushed to this house. He'll come down with fever. He basically dies of gangrene. He doesn't die of gangrene. His arm is, uh, is infected and becomes gangrenous. And as a result of the gangrene, he contracts pneumonia and dies of pneumonia. So, yeah, he lives for just under a week after he's shot. He will then be transported back to Lexington. His body will actually lay in state. I didn't learn this until after I lived in this room. His body actually laid in state in the room that I lived in that summer, um, which is, yeah, kind of interesting. And he is buried in Lexington, Virginia now, um, in the cemetery that bears his name. Um, that, no, they weren't, because they thought, because they were all, so it was a rainy night in early May, and they came back wearing rain jackets. So rain jackets were actually produced by Goodyear at this period of time. So the, these rain jackets were black. So they thought they were Union coming through. And uh, in, the, in the VMI Museum where his horse is, is the jacket, the rain jacket, and you can still see the bullet hole through the left arm in the jacket. Um, kind of kind of a weird piece of, of a weird artifact still laying around. All right, uh, let's move on to the next corps commander. This is James Longstreet, a.k.a. Old Pete, also known as Lee's War Horse. He was raised in Georgia and Alabama, graduated from West Point in 1842, um, serves in the Mexican War, rose to the rank of major, resigned from the Army in June of 1861, to join the Confederacy as a brigadier general, meaning he was a commander of a brigade. He will raise to the rank of major general following Bull Run, and he'll get a corps command during the Seven Days Battle um, under Lee. So after Joseph E. Johnston's wounded, uh, Longstreet will ra rise to corps commander. He had operational command of nearly half of Lee's army uh, following the Seven Days. Seven days battles um, are fought from late June into early July of 1862. These are the final battles of the Peninsula Campaign. I'll get into that. Again, we'll be getting into the war in 62 in lessons seven and eight. He and Jackson again became Lee's Corps commanders. Just to be clear, Seven Pines was not part of the Seven Days. Seven Pines occurred before the Seven Days. Um, we'll get into that later. Um, so he was a big defensive fighter. Troops under his command never lost the defensive position during the war. As I said before, he's referred to as Lee's war horse. Um, led soldiers in the Second Battle of Bull Run, Battle of Antietam, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg. He actually tried to talk Lee out of taking the offensive at Gettysburg. Um, Jackson was dead by this point, so there wasn't, you know, Jackson was not there to counsel. The Western Theater, Battle of Chickamauga, border of Tennessee and Georgia, the Battle of Chattanooga. Moving back east, the Battle of the Wilderness, same area where the Battle of Chancellorsville had occurred in 63, only this time in 1864. He was wounded there. And then he is sort of the the brains behind the defensive trench warfare and siege lines of Petersburg. He's credited as the founding father of the defensive siege, siege technique and trench warfare technique in modern warfare. Surrendered with Lee at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, he goes on to politics after the war, and he becomes a Republican. Bum, bum, bum. What, is, what do we call a Southerner, notably a Confederate, former Confederate, that becomes a member of the Republican Party? 
Okay? Yes, a traitor might be in the minds of most, but there's a name for these people that we've learned about. It starts with an S. So it starts with an S associated with pirates. Swashbuckler is a good guess. You're on the right track. Scalawag, very good. Nice job. Scalawag, which is basically a traitor. So he is a Republican Scalawag in the post-war era. Um, we'll talk more about, about uh, Longstreet and the converted Scalawag Republicans in the Reconstruction era. All right, Albert Sidney Johnston, um, he's kind of like the lead of the West, born in Kentucky, lived much of his life in Texas, graduated from West Point in 1826, served in the Black Hawk Wars, resigned his commission in 1834 to take care of his dying wife in Kentucky. Um, following the death of his wife, he enlists as a private in the Texas Army during the Texas Revolution. Uh, the War for Texas Independence in 1836. A constant reminder would be up here on the wall, the original Texas flag, come and take it. Promoted to major and the position of aide-de-camp of Sam Houston one month later, who was the first president and governor of Texas, Roberts County native from Virginia, not far from my stomping grounds. Um, in August of 1836, becomes an adjutant general and colonel of the Republic of the Texas Army. And in January of 1837, became senior brigadier general in command of the Texas Army. However, he did fight in a duel with Felix Houston over command of the army. He lost the duel and lost the command. He refused to fire. He was shot in the pelvis. Why did he refuse to fire? Uh, well, he didn't feel like... Uh, so, most duels are fought over honor, and I don't think he, he wanted to... This, his honor was not... His honor nor Houston's honor, this isn't Sam Houston, Felix, were... Um, there, was, there wasn't like any dishonor in this situation and he and Houston actually had a relationship <coughs> serving in this war. He did not want to want to kill the guy. Um, but Houston obviously uh, shot for blood and, and connected. He goes on to serve as Secretary of War for Texas. Remember, in 1838, what is Texas? It's a what? Yeah, it's its own nation. It's an independent republic. All right, so he returns to the Texas Army as a colonel, leads the first Texas Rifle Volunteers, and in the Mexican War he fights in the battles of Monterey and Buena Vista. He also served in the Utah War against the Mormons in 1857, which we talked about during James Buchanan's presidency. In 1861, he was commander of the United States Army Department of the Pacific in California. He had risen to the rank of Brigadier General. He was actually one of the highest ranking um, U.S. Army officers to go to the side of the Confederacy. He resigned when Texas seceded. He was appointed General of the Western Department of the Confederacy by Davis. He wanted to defend the Confederate lines in the Mississippi and the Allegheny Mountains. He is the guy that's responsible for raising the Western Army of the Mississippi. His subordinate generals lost Forts Henry and Donelson to Grant in 1861, and he planned the attack that led to the Battle of Shiloh, or Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Landing in April of 1861. Caught Grant and Sherman by surprise, but he was killed when a gunshot wound went through his leg, severed a major artery, and he bled out in his boot. 
He is the highest ranking Confederate general killed in the war. This is the equivalent of like Lee dying in the East, Albert Sidney Johnson. Nathan, Bed Nathan Bedford Forrest, any questions about Albert Sidney Johnson? Okay, yes, Forrest Gump's named for Nathan Bedford Forrest. Forrest Gump, obviously, historical fiction. Um, he's not real, but Nathan Bedford Forrest certainly was. Born poor, became the head of his family at the age of 17, rags to riches tail. He made a fortune on selling slaves along the Mississippi. After the war, he was one of the leading founders of the Ku Klux Klan. He enlisted as a private in the Confederacy. What didn't like the way that the army was being formed in Tennessee, so he decided to buy his own horses, equipment, and form his own regiment of Tennessee volunteers. He used his own money to raise this regiment. Promoted to colonel, given command of his own regiment, it's known as Force Tennessee Cavalry Battalion. No prior military training or experience, self-taught. He was one of the first and leading cavalrymen that was that used mobile mobile warfare. He would say, "Get there firstest with the mostest." Battle of Paducah, Kentucky. He led a mounted cavalry of 2,500 soldiers over 100 miles in only 50 hours. So he was he was sort of like the Jeb Stewart of the West, fast moving. He also they also disguised themselves in Union uniforms behind enemy lines. And he was involved in a lot of engagements in the West. Became the master of guerrilla style tactics. Some would call him a bushwhacker, others would call him a partisan. It's kind of hard to call him a bushwhacker or a partisan because why? Excellent. He has a legit command. Very good. Constantly harassed the enemy with fast moving raids, disrupted supply ch trains and communication, drove Grant into fits of anger over these raids. Um, one in particular, Shiloh, where he and his troopers were behind enemy lines figuring out that Don Carlos Buell was sending in reinforcements. Um, I don't want to give away the story, but basically he rides into, uh, rides into Union force and picks up a Union soldier, throws him on the back of his horse as he rides out to use as a human shield. Um, he and his men, again, dressed in Union uniforms um, for intel. They were involved in the following major engagements, Fort Donelson, Shiloh, Murfreesboro, um, raids in Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, Battle of Days Gap, Battle of Chickamauga, Battle of Paducah, Kentucky, Battle or Massacre of Fort Pillow, Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, raids in Tennessee, Battle of Spring Hill, Battle of Franklin, and the Battle of Nashville. Any questions about Forrest? All right. Joseph E. Johnson, Farmville, Virginia native. Do I have any Longwood College Lancers out there? Any family with Longwood ties? A couple of you guys? Cool. Um, Longwood College's president currently lives in the Joseph E. Johnston home place. He graduated West Point class of 1929, 13th in his class, classmate of Robert E. Lee, served in the Mexican-American War at both Cerro Gordo and Chapultepec. He's wounded in both, what's that? Oh, yep, my bad, 1829. I'll fix that in a second. Um, served in California. Um, appointed Quartermaster General for the U.S. Army in 1860. He is the highest ranking U.S. Army officer to resign and join the Confederacy. He also felt that he should be the highest ranking Confederate General. He does have a command. Do you remember what Army Davis puts him in command of? 
well, yeah, it's called the Army of the Shenandoah, but once Lee takes control, it becomes known as the Army of what? Northern Virginia. Very good. Nice job. Uh, organized the Army of the Shenandoah in the first Battle of Bull Run. Placed in command of the Army of Northern Virginia. Defended Richmond during the Peninsula Campaign or Peninsula Campaign. Um, this is defense against McClellan's attempted invasion of Richmond. Wounded the Battle of Seven Pines. He <coughs> was replaced by classmate Robert E. Lee. Given command in the Western Department, based off of Grant and Sherman. His strategy was defensive, criticized for unwillingness to risk an offensive, removed from command after Atlanta fell, returned to command to stop Sherman's march to the sea, did not have the resources to sh stop Sherman. He will ultimately surrender his army to Sherman at Bennett Place near Durham following the Battle of Bentonville two weeks after Appomattox. He ignored Jefferson Davis's orders not to surrender. This was the largest standing army that the Confederacy surrendered. Here's some other key Confederate generals. Ambrose P. Hill, A.P. Hill, West Point class of 1842. Um, A.P. Hill has roots to right down the street. He has roots to um, Belgrade Plantation, right down the street. We're all familiar with that. Um, he will serve throughout the war. He actually, uh, kind of an interesting thing, he picked up a case of gonorrhea when he was a cadet at West Point. This is a true story. He had a really hard time in the saddle as a result of it. Not any, yeah, not any penicillin, guys. Um, he was uh, famous for uh, wearing this white, red, checkered shirt into battle. Um, some One significant battle he's involved in is going to be the Battle of, um, of Antietam, where he faces off with um, one of his buddies from West Point and another anecdotal story that must be shared, and that is George B. McClellan. Uh, do keep in mind that A.P. Hill um, had asked for Ellen McClellan's hand in marriage, but her father was not having it. He, she did, he did not want a uh, rough and ready military officer, especially not, not to mention the whole venereal disease issue that was going on with A.P. Hill, did not, did not want this man uh, marrying his daughter. So McClellan, uh, A.P. Hill and Ellen break things off. Um, his buddy from West Point ends up courting her and marrying her. So the love of A.P. Hill's life uh, marries his buddy George B. McClellan, an adversary um, in the war. A.P. Hill, also interesting thing. Are you guys, you ever crossed over Laburnum and uh, Brook Road? Or it's not Brook, Brooklyn, over on the north side, close to the Diamond. Okay, no, it might be Hermitage. It might be Hermitage and Laburnum. I think it is Hermitage and Laburnum. A. P. Hill's statue is there, and he is buried underneath it. Yeah. Uh, Jubal Early, um, Jubal Early, West Point class of eighteen thirty-seven. Um, he is uh, going to be one of the Stonewall Brigade commanders. Um, he's one of Jackson's men uh, from Lynchburg, Virginia. There's an incident that occurs with Jubal Early and a Union general that we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, the, the Union um, Officer is Terrell. I'll talk about the Terrell incident but later. Jeb Stewart, class of 1854. Um, he is the leading cavalry commander for Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, he will die from his wounds suffered from the Battle of 
Yellow Tavern. Um, if you're familiar with where the the Richmond City Second Precinct is, Richmond City Police Second Precinct, he died right in an ambulance right in front of that Second Precinct. We'll talk more about Jeb Stewart throughout 62, 63, and 64. Richard Yule, uh, West Point, class of 1840. He's another one of Jackson's men. Braxton Bragg, class of 1837, close friend of Jefferson Davis. He has a major command um, in the Western Department. He is a uh, not only a military, but a political appointment as well. John Bell Hood, he's the guy that I told you that replaced uh, Louis T. Wigfall in the Texas, um, the first Texas infantry. He'll go on to get command um, in the Western Department as well. George Pickett, um, he graduated in Jackson's class. He's one of Lee's commanders. He's going to end up um, leading the, the fateful Pickett's charge on the final day of engagement at Gettysburg. Um, you guys may have mentioned or noted, or I noted before, and you may have already kn known this, Pickett was appointed to West Point by Abraham Lincoln. That's what his congressional appointment was from. Kirby Smith, commander of the Trans-Mississippi um, Confederate Forces, west of the Mississippi, West Point class of 1845. And then John Singleton Mosby, um, he is the known as the Gray Ghost. Um, he went. He was uh, Lee's most trusted partisan in Northern Virginia and in the Shenandoah Valley. He first attended Hampton Sydney College, where he transferred to the University of Virginia, but was ultimately kicked out um, for shooting a classmate uh, with a pistol over a dispute over honor. Okay. Any uh, questions about our Confederate leaders? Moving on with our Union folks, Ulysses S. Grant, born in uh, born Hiram Ulysses Grant. Anybody know how he ends up Ulysses Simpson Grant? This is kind of an interesting story. His mother's middle name is Simpson, but the, when he got his congressional appointment, the guy that gave him his appointment didn't realize his name was Hiram Ulysses. He just thought his name was Ulysses Simpson. So he wrote on the appointment, Ulysses S. Grant, and then Grant just went with it. So from then on, from the time he went to West Point, he just started going by U.S. Grant due to a clerical mistake made by a congressman. Um, graduates in 1843, 21st in his class. Serves in the Mexican-American War under Zachary Taylor and Old Fuss and Feathers. This is the first time he met Lee. In fact, he brought this up with Lee at Appomattox, but Lee didn't remember meeting him in the Mexican War. Um, served in a number of different battles in the Mexican War. Resaca de la Palma, Palo Alto, Monterey, Veracruz, a lot of these were the battles in northern Mexico and California. <coughs> Promoted twice for bravery at Molino del Rey and Chapultepec. Moved to several different posts, Fort Vancouver in the Washington Territory, where he served as a regimental quartermaster in charge of supply for the 4th U.S. Infantry. Promoted to captain at Fort Humboldt, California, but resigned in 1831 he was unhappy about being away from his family and he started getting into heavy drinking and the drunkenness led to him either being either resigning or facing a trial for court-martial. There is Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, in civilian life, failed at most of his endeavors like running a general store he was so broke, at one point he had to pawn his watch to buy Christmas presents. He also had to take a loan from uh, one of his buddies from West Point, Simon Bolivar Buckner, who will actually be the guy that surrenders to him at Fort Donelson. 
After Fort Sumter, he's appointed a colonel of the 21st Illinois Infantry. He coaxed Leonidas Polk to invade Kentucky, promoted to Brigadier General, captured Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, first major Union victories in the West for the war. This is where he got the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant because Buckner, he and Buckner had this prior relationship at West Point, and he thought that, or Buckner thought that he would have a more conditional surrender, and Grant said it will be unconditional surrender. I will advance upon the breastworks. Promoted to Major General as a result of these victories. In the Battle of Shiloh, he won the battle but lost the command to William or to Henry Halleck Old Brains. But this was short-lived because he was winning battles and Lincoln wanted to bring Halleck back to to DC. Yeah, to DC as an advisor and then he'll regain control of the Army of Western Tennessee in June. He meaning Grant, not Halleck. From then until the end of the war, he'll be general in chief of all armies. He'll move uh, on, sorry, general in chief of the armies in the West, and then he'll move east. Some of the significant battles he's involved in in the West, siege of Vicksburg, turning point of the war in the West, Battle of Chickamauga, Battle of Chattanooga that opens up the door to march on Atlanta. So he, when he moves east to replace George Meade, Sherman will replace him in the west. He will battle Lee in the Overland Campaign in 1864, in the Battles of the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Cold Harbor, the Siege of Petersburg, and he'll accept the surrender at Appomattox. Fighting methods, master of, of combat by outmaneuvering opponents, either through siege techniques or direct assaults. Um, a lot of his tactics resulted in heavy casualties. So, for example, he could replace his losses, but Confederates could not. And he'll go on to become elected 18th president of the United States after the war, and we'll be talking about him in the era of Reconstruction. All right, let's take a look at Grant's right-hand man, William T. Sherman. William comes to Sherman from Lancaster, Ohio, graduated sixth in his class from West Point. Probably should have graduated higher, but he had a problem with the merits. Um, second lieutenant in the U.S. Artillery in Florida in the Second Seminole War, stationed in Georgia and South Carolina for a time, in fact, this is why a lot of people believe that he was sort of like brought in by the South Abroad uh, sort of high society <coughs> families of Charleston. And that time in Charleston is why a lot of, of historians believe that Sherman spared Charleston um, from on the march to Savannah and then from Savannah on to Columbia, South Carolina. Stationed in California during the Mexican War, resigned his commission to become a bank president in San Francisco. He then goes on to become military superintendent um, of, the, of LSU, or the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. It's now known as LSU. And they adopted tigers as their mascot because that's what they called their Confederate <laughs> fighting force that came out of that, came out of that area their nickname. Uh, this was offered to him by a couple of Army buddies um, and West Point friends, PGT Beauregard and Braxton Bragg. He resigned when the war broke out. He wrote correspondence with his Southern friends. He's one of the only people that said that the war was going to last four years or more. And it actually and, and it came to fruition. Distinguished himself as a command as a brigadier general at the Battle of Bull Run. And he gets moved west to the Department of Cumberland in Kentucky. Here we have William T. Sherman. As commander in the West, he suffered a nervous breakdown uh, over the complications of the command, 
contemplated suicide over the daunting task of the command. His command was turned over to Don Carlos Buell, fought as a division commander under Grant at Shiloh, prevented a disastrous defeat at Shiloh, promoted to major general, and this starts a really close relationship between he and Grant. He actually kept Grant from resigning at one point. And then this is one of my favorite quotes from Sherman. Grant stood me, by me when I was crazy, and I stood by him when he was drunk. Now we stand by each other always. That's friendship. He launched a total war or scorched earth approach to battle. So what we have there on the left is an example of scorched earth. Do you see what those guys are doing? Can you tell what those guys are doing in the image? Yeah, they're wrapping railroad tracks around the trees. These were called Sherman neckties. So every, everything was destroyed on the march from Atlanta, from Chattanooga to Atlanta, and Atlanta to Savannah. So, um, this is a strategic, economic, and psychological warfare to try to crush the Confederacy. So, scorched earth is going to be the tactic. Grant supported it. He ordered Philip Sheridan to do the same in the Shenandoah Valley. And Joseph E. Johnson surrenders to Sherman at the end of the war. All right, little Mac, George B. McClellan, any questions about Sherman? All right, born and raised in Philadelphia, graduated second in this class at West Point, served under Winfield Scott in the Mexican War, transferred to the Cavalry in 1855, Studied, studied European armies and military tactics of the Crimean War, resigned his commission in 1857, but rejoined when the war broke out, commanded the Ohio militia, occupied the area of Western Virginia, and the Western Virginia campaign against Lee. He got support and supported Unionists, and his mission was to protect the Baltimore and Ohio. He defeated two small Confederate armies in 1861 in Western Virginia and became famous throughout. After the Union defeat at the First Battle of Bull Run, Lincoln appointed him commander of the Army of the Potomac to replace Irvin McDowell on July 26, 1861. He replaced Winfield Scott, as Supreme Commander of the Union Army in November, launched the Peninsula Campaign in March. He was defeated and pushed out of Virginia by Lee in early July, replaced by General John Pope in July, reinstated after Pope was defeated at Second Bull Run, but failed to crush Lee after the Battle of Antietam, even though he found Lee's battle plans wrapped in cigars before the battle. Replaced by General Ambrose, Ambrose Burnside following the, Mar the Maryland campaign and Antietam was a brilliant military organizer and training soldiers but lacked the will to pursue the enemy, especially when it came to Robert E. Lee. He was intimidated by Lee's army because he believed Lee's army was larger than it actually was. Overly cautious, believed the Confederate Army was very large, too fond of his men to handle large casualties, lack of personal courage, stayed miles away from the fighting, and wanted Lincoln to fail. He actually runs against Lincoln in the election of 1864. He ran as the Democratic candidate, but Union troops voted for Lincoln over him by a margin of three to one. McClellan will go on to become governor of New Jersey at the end of the Reconstruction era. Notice that a lot of these guys get involved in politics following the war. Philip Sheridan, born in Albany, New York, but grew up in Ohio, 
graduated from West Point in 1853, suspended for the first year in a fist fight with William R. Terrell. Um, note that I talked about the Terrell brothers. Did I mention the Terrell brothers before? This is a really interesting story from the Civil War. William R. Terrell, they're both from, from Bath County, Virginia. William was born in Covington, near where I grew up. About 10 miles from my hometown is Covington. And his brother James was born in Bath County, uh, right over the, it's basically borders the county I grew up in, Allegheny. William went to West Point and James went to VMI. When the war broke out, William stayed loyal to the Union because of the oath he took to, to the Union at West Point, and James went to fight with the Confederacy. This is a really supreme example of the Brothers' War. William died at Perryville, and I think James may have died at the Battle of Franklin. I have to double check that. Um, I know William's buried at the West Point Cemetery, and I think James is buried somewhere in Virginia. But that's sort of a brother's, brother's war example. As a second lieutenant, he's assigned to Fort Duncan, Texas, and then uh, Fourth U.S. Infantry. We're not talking about the Terrells anymore. We're talking about Sheridan. When the war broke out, he was appointed Colonel of the Second Michigan Volunteer Cavalry. At the Battle of Boonville, um, he held back several regiments of Confederate cavalry in Missouri. Promoted to Brigadier General. Took command of the 11th Division of the Third Corps of the Army of the Ohio in the Western Department. In the in the Western Theater. Fought in the Battle of Stones River, held back the Confederate advance on Murfreesboro, promoted to Major General, and given command of the 2nd Division of the Army of the Cumberland. Battle of Chickamauga, Battle of Chattanooga, Battle of Missionary Ridge, broke through Confederate lines. Grant liked it, so he moved Sheridan to the east. In the Eastern Theater in 1864, he's given a Cavalry Corps. He'll fight in the Battle of the Wilderness. Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, Battle of Yellow Tavern where Jeb Stewart was wounded and ultimately dies, Battle of Cold Harbor. He's sent to lead the battle, the army of the Shenandoah created by Grant in 1864. This is U.S., not Confederate. The purpose was to drive Confederates out of the valley. Sheridan was to launch the burning, scorched earth, total war tactics in the Valley of Virginia famous quote from Sheridan about the Shenandoah. If a crow wants to fly down the Shenandoah, he must carry his own provisions with him. The Battle of Five Forks cuts Lee's uh, lines of support, forcing Lee to evacuate Petersburg. And then at Appomattox, blocked Lee's escape, facing the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. George Meade, born in Spain, his father was a wealthy merchant in Philadelphia, graduated from West Point in 1835, served in the Mexican War, promoted to first lieutenant for gallant conduct. He uh, gets put on lighthouse duty, he was a brilliant engineer, designed lighthouses and the hydraulic lamp for American lighthouses, promoted from captain to brigadier general, Constructed defenses around Washington, D.C. Joined McClellan's army in the Peninsula Campaign. Severely wounded in the Seven Days. Served in the Second Battle of Bull Run. Served in Antietam where he was wounded again. And the Battle of Fredericksburg where he was promoted to Major General. He was given command of the entire Army of the Potomac. Replacing General Joe Hooker following the Battle of Chancellorsville. Just days later, he faced Lee at Gettysburg, deployed his forces in a defensive battle, 
to hold the high ground along Cemetery Ridge. Gettysburg reacted quickly to fierce assaults on his lines left, right, and center. Won the battle, was the turning point of the war in the east. Criticized for not pursuing the Confederates fast enough. And Lincoln believed that he wasted an opportunity to end the war in the Northern Virginia Bristow campaign following Gettysburg. In 1864, Grant travels with Meade's army and will ultimately take command of Meade's army and the Army of the Potomac in the Overland Campaign. Interesting thing about Meade, he never lost a major battle. He initiated himself. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, born in Maine, lived near Harriet Beecher Stowe, much like Harriet Beecher Stowe. He had very strong abolitionist views, <coughs> graduated Bowdoin College, returned to Bowdoin as a professor of rhetoric. When the war broke out, he received a commission as a lieutenant colonel of the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment, fought at Fredericksburg, Antietam, Chancellorsville, and as a result of Chancellorsville was promoted to colonel of the regiment. His brother served in his regiment as well, his brother Thomas. Achieved fame in the Battle of Gettysburg where the 20th Maine defeated the Union flank at the Battle of Little Round Top. He used an unusual flanking wheelwright movement, movement with fixed bayonets to drive back the 15th Alabama Infantry. Considered by many to be the key U.S. victory in the Battle of Gettysburg. Forced home by malaria, but returned to service in 1864. Severely wounded at Petersburg. Grant promoted him to Brigadier General. Uh, assumed that he wouldn't make it, but he actually did. Took charge of accepting the surrender of arms at Appomattox. <coughs> criticized for having his men salute their defeated enemy. In all, he served in 20 battles, numerous skirmishes, and was wounded six times in the war. And believe it or not, his wounds led to some major advancements in the study of urology. George H. Thomas, Southampton County native, he and his sisters and his mother were forced to hide in the woods during the Nat Turner Rebellion in 1831. Graduated from West Point in 1840. He and William T. Sherman were roommates. Served in the Seminole Wars. Distinguished service in the Mexican War. Battle of Fort Brown. Resaca de la Palma, Monterey, Buena Vista. Three promotions for distinguished service. Goes back to West Point as an instructor. Promoted to major. Wounded by a Native American arrow in the Battle of Clear Fork on the Brazos River in Texas. Refused to go with Virginia when Virginia seceded. He stayed with the Union. Promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel and Brigadier General. Commanded a brigade in the 1st Manassas. Assigned to the Western Theater following Bull Run after Shiloh was given command of five divisions led a successful siege of Corinth, Mississippi, served as Don Carlos Buell's second in command at the Battle of Perryville, stopped the Confederate invasion of Kentucky yet again, held a desperate position to prevent Union disaster at the Battle of Chickamauga. His nickname was the Rock of Chickamauga. Provided the logistics and engineering support that Sherman needed for the siege of Atlanta and the march to, to the sea. Commander in the Battle of Nashville in December of 1864. Defended Nashville from counterattack while Sherman marched to the sea. Destroyed the Confederate Army there. Promoted to Major General and earned the, another nickname, the Sledge of Nashville. William Rosecran, born in Delaware County, Ohio. Graduated West Point in 1842, another famous West Point class from the Civil War. 
assigned as an engineer, worked on fortifications at Hampton Roads, served as an instructor at West Point, took over a mining business in Western Virginia, what is now West Virginia, was very successful. When the war broke out, he became aide-de-camp to McClellan's Ohio Infantry in Western Virginia, promoted to the rank of Colonel, took command of the 23rd Ohio Infantry Regiment. Two future presidents served on, in his regiment, Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley, promoted to Brigadier General and requested a transfer to the West. He was upset McClellan was getting credit for the victory in Western Virginia. Replaced Don Carlos Buell as commander of the Western 14th Corps. Forced Confederates to withdraw at the Battle of Stones River or Murfreesboro. Blundered the Battle of Chickamauga, but crisis was averted by Thomas. And his biggest victory was fi uh, facing off with Bragg and forcing Bragg to abandon Chattanooga, Tennessee, opening the door for Sherman to march on Atlanta. Other key Union generals, Robert Anderson, West Point class of 1825, commander at Fort Sumter, Irvin McDowell, commander at Bull Run, class of 1838, Ambrose Burnside, commander of the Army of the Potomac that replaced McClellan, 1847, Nathaniel Banks, the Bobbin Boy, uh, who self-taught in the libraries of Boston, um, George Armstrong Custer, West Point class of June 1861. Abner Doubleday, who is credited with being the inventor of baseball, but that's hotly debated by historians. West Point class of 1842, major command at the Battle of Gettysburg. Winfield Scott Hancock, West Point class of 1844, commanded the center line uh, at Gettysburg, goes on to run for president after the war. Arthur MacArthur enlisted at 17. He's called the Boy Colonel, father of Douglas MacArthur, who we're going to talk about in our World War II class next semester. Benjamin Butler uh, graduated from Phillips Exeter Prep and went on to Waterville College, now Colby, um, studied law. He's known as the Beast. He's going to have a major Union command. Daniel Sickles, NYU grad, studied law, law under Benjamin Butler. Alfred Pleasanton, cavalry commander, West Point class of 1844. He faces off with Stewart at Brandy Station. Joseph Hooker, he had replaced uh, Burnside, West Point class of 1837. He'll be replaced by Meade. John F. Reynolds, one of the most respected generals on the Union side. He will die in the uh, early event, uh, uh, early conflict at Gettysburg. And then John Buford, cavalry commander at Gettysburg, West Point class of 1848. So to wrap things up, a little bit about West Point, established in 1801. Did anybody have any questions about those Union folks? Established in, by Congress in 1801, fully supported by Thomas Jefferson through the Military Peace Establishment Act of 1802, opened on July 4th, 1802, and founded to create regular Army officers and citizen soldiers with in instruction in infantry, artillery, cavalry, and engineering. First superintendent, was head of the Army Corps of Engineers, Jonathan Williams. Joseph Gardner Smith was the first graduate. He also become, becomes one of the first superintendents of West Point. In 1817, Colonel Savannah Thayer becomes superintendent, appointed by Secretary of War John C. Calhoun. He is going to change and revolutionize military training, scientific education, and engineering at the academy. He makes civil engineering the foundation of the curriculum. 
You need to understand the academy was originally pushed for by Washington, Henry Knox, and Baron von Steuben following the American Revolution. They modeled their curriculum after uh, the French Polytech, one of the oldest military colleges in, in the world. New cadets started with just French and math. Then came practical science, engineering, calculus, trigonometry, and natural sciences. Afternoons, military training, extremely rigorous inspections, academic, academic examinations, daily rankings, demerit system, and I should have put here at the end, drill, 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 nonstop drill. Half of those that started left before graduation. The same occurs in most military institutions in America today. You, you typically graduate um, at a lot of the military schools with about half your class. Robert E. Lee was one of the few graduates to finish without a single demerit. No infraction for conduct. This is what, what West Point looked like then. Some notable classmates that we've talked about today. Class of 1838, Beauregard and McDowell that face off in the first Battle of Bull Run. 1842, John Pope and Longstreet face off at the Battle of Second Bull Run or Manassas. Class of 1846, McClellan and Stonewall Jackson face off in the Peninsula Campaign. This is what West Point looks like now. Pretty cool. Very hard to get into. It's one of the hardest colleges in the country to get into. Little comparison chart of the Army organization. We talked about this in Lesson 5. You've got your core, your divisions, your brigades, your regiments, your companies, down to your platoons and squads. So this is the Army of the Potomac in the east and the Army of Northern Virginia in the east. And this is where we're headed for Lesson 7. And as we move forward, again, got to give a shout out to my main man, Steve Bailey for putting together this little um, graphic. Whoops. Oh, come on. It's not working. All right, I'll show you in a second. <laughs> 